Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, this week I want to talk about salt. So salt, I know, you know, this, some of this may be stating the obvious, but it's, it's a mineral, it's a, a mineral that's essential to life. And depending on the type of salt, meaning the location where it's harvested, um, how it was processed, the geographical location determines uh, the type and the amount of minerals that are present in the salt that you're eating. So I'm going to talk more about that and, and really focus on the types of salt that I use in my diet, the types of salt that I recommend to people uh, that they use in their diet. Um, so you can get some more clarity around this, but also I'm going to talk about how to, um, how to enhance the flavor and mineral content and digestibility of your foods um, by salting uh, your foods before you actually cook them. So let me talk just for a little bit more about salt because I feel like it can be a confusing topic because our health practitioners and our government and medical system and all those idiots, right? They tell us Salt is bad, it causes high blood pressure. You really wanna monitor your intake. And of course, we do. you do wanna monitor your intake if you're eating their salt, or their table salt. It's total crap, it'll cause health issues for sure. Um, but the healthy stuff is really beneficial to your health and your body will tell you how much salt you actually need. So, you know, one of my pet peeves is um, when people are like, yeah, I add a teaspoon of salt to this and that it's like, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's very similar to the, I drink eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. Why? Because like a pamphlet told you to do that. That's, you know, we have to start listening to our bodies when it comes to the foods that we, um, are drawn to, uh, when it comes to our thirst and the amount and type of water that we want, you know, and I talk about this all the time and people avoid cold water because some health practitioner, Chinese med doc told them that cold water will slow down the digestion. It's total horse crap. Yeah. It may slow down somebody's digestion, but some people crave cold water and it's actually, there's a lot of benefit to that. When you do crave cold water, um, and also the same thing can be said when it comes to salt, if you're actually craving salt, your body is needing that mineral or some of the minerals in the salt at this time. And so you have to go with that restricting your intake of salt, um, when your body's really craving it, you know, your body's going to crave it for a reason. It's needing something. It's seeking something in, in the nutrients that the salt provides. So salt also is a combination of two electrolytes, right? We have sodium and chloride and sodium is also located inside our cells, inside the cytoplasm where the mitochondria are also located. And, um, I threw that in there because I know there's a lot of mitochondria on here and, um, you know, so that's, that can be important. And it's important because, um, sodium as well as potassium, calcium, and other molecules are located inside the cell, inside the cytoplasm. And the sodium in, in particular helps to create an electrical charge inside the cell. Okay. So it is extremely important. It plays a major role in the conduct in the conduction of energy inside each one of your cells. Literally, if you didn't have that present in your cells, you would be dead. Okay. Uh, you, and, and you can tell if that function is decreasing, um, just by paying attention to your energy levels. Okay. Now the salt that you eat isn't, I just want to be really clear about that. Yes. It impacts the salt inside your cells, inside the cytoplasm and the electrical current that's generated inside your cells. Yes, of course it influences that, but the salt that you eat isn't the only thing that that influences your intracellular salt levels, sodium levels. The salt inside your cells is actually largely determined by your lifestyle. Um, we know that man-made EMFs 
totally deplete the cellular, uh, the sodium balance inside your cells. It also disturbs the calcium balance inside your cells. Jack Cruz has talked about that a lot and in ways that people have no idea how to understand, including myself. It's like, but we, the, the basic, the basic thing to take away from that is that um, exposure to, to man-made EMFs, Wi-Fi, cell phones, Bluetooth, this and that, um, uh, your cell phone, right? All of these things, what happens is they, they literally dehydrate the cell by, um, um, depleting sodium, depleting calcium, depleting the levels of other, uh, molecules in, in your cell. So EMFs play a huge role, uh, excuse me, a huge role. It's mercury retrograde. So I'm bound to just totally fudge my words through this whole episode, which is common for me in general. So, um, <laughs> it could be even worse today, warning. Uh, but, um, man-made EMFs play a huge role, uh, in your intracellular sodium levels, uh, as well as calcium and so forth. And so, um, let's say you're having symptoms. Uh, what would this look like? Maybe you have more leg cramps at night or, or just in general cramping, spasms, muscle twitching. I think, uh, for those of you who are new to the podcast, um, it was almost exactly a year ago uh, that my wife and I moved out of Sedona, Arizona, and we moved into our, our farm here in northern New Mexico. And um, we lived in Sedona for about two years. And, you know, the cell service was amazing. And there's, you know, they have millions of people, tourists visit their uh, town, city every year. And so um, while they're the, the, general population who lives in Sedona is relatively low. The, 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 the amount of tourists that visit this place is exponentially high. Uh, therefore, the EMF um, exposure, footprint load, whatever you want to call it, is exceptionally high there. Um, and so when I was there, um, I couldn't use my cell phone without getting muscle spasms and muscle twitching. As soon as we moved to our farm, which we're really um, uh, very happy about that. Uh, one thing we're really happy about is that the EMF exposure is like, it's, it's so low. It's, we, you know, we're, our internet's hardwired. We don't get cell service. We have, um, for those of you who are on YouTube, you can see this. I'm going to hold it up. This thing um, is how I, I do my social media posting, which is which I'm slacking these days. I've been um, I'm honestly I've been soaking up the sun. I've been so busy uh, this summer that I'm like, I need some me time in the sun and I've been soaking it up. So Instagram is, you know, that's the first to go, honestly. And and when um, when uh, Pluto goes into Aquarius, now I'm channeling my, my wife here, <laughs> um, the internet and, and so forth will go down anyway. So why not try to do something different and plan for when that shit show happens? Um, but anyway, this is what I use. You can get it from Tech Wellness. And this little guy goes into my ethernet cord and this goes into the to my iPhone. And so you keep your phone in airport mode and boom, you plug it in and you can do all your social horse shit by, you know, just doing that. So, um, you know, so basically what I'm saying is our EMF exposure here is super low and both her and I have seen drastic um, shifts in our, just like subtle shifts. And I say drastic because they're not present anymore. Like every time my wife would turn her phone on and off of airport mode when we lived in Sedona, she'd get vertigo. She still gets that if she goes into town and have to like look up a, a Google map or something. And honestly, we, we're going old school. We're getting, um, just ordered a bunch of like city maps. So when we go into the city, we boom, bust out the map. And um, uh, not that we really need it in Santa Fe because we've we've been pretty much living in this city for 
around the city for the last decade. But you know, hey, sometimes there's a new this or that you have to look up. We got the old school maps, no need for Google. They don't need to know where I am. They don't know what they need to know what the F I'm doing. They don't, okay? So, you know, and that might be next level for some of you, but I'm telling you, it's the brain does different things. You know, the brain works differently when you have to like look at a map and like make some actual decisions and use some other senses besides just some robot telling you what to do it's it literally you start to develop new and different neural pathways so i highly recommend buying some maps your husband partner whoever may actually kill you at this point in time but but I really I recommend it go for it you know you can sneak out your map you know hey honey we don't need google maps I've I actually purchased this and make it sound really nice and it gets us so fancy and look at how glossy it is you know whatever but no that's 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 what we're doing we're we're, we're going we're going for that because literally whenever she turns her phone on she gets the vertigo when we're in town I get really sleepy or when I was in Sedona what happened was is I would get um, muscle twitches. Like my muscles would twitch all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, it is so annoying. And some people will get symptoms like that and they'll be like, I need to go to my neurologist. I really need to get this looked out. Literally, if you just get rid of your Wi-Fi and learn how to not use your phone or to use it in quote unquote safe ways, probably, you know, uh, uh, several of your symptoms will go away. Like, so some people will be like, hey, I'm having some neurological issue, or I should really get that checked out. And it's usually something in your environment that's driving that. So back to salt, right? Because um, now I eat the same amount of salt here that I ate in Sedona. So it has nothing to do with the salt that I'm taking into my body as to why I'm not getting muscle twitches and um, why she's not getting vertigo. It's because we have reduced significantly our EMF um, exposure. So um, this is really important because um, uh, most people don't consider how this can, uh, you know, um, this exposure can influence your intracellular sodium levels, but also um, your calcium levels and the calcium inside your cytoplasm and and then, you know, when these things start to get depleted, you get health issues, you get muscle twitches or spasms, you um, get vertigo, you have thyroid issues, you have sleep issues, you have energy level issues, um, you have um, your because of the influence that the EMFs have on calcium and, and how it fluctuates within the cell with your exposure to EMFs, you're gonna, you know, people who are really exposed to this stuff can now break their bones much more easily uh, or have, you know, muscle joint issues. So it's a real thing. And most people are like, ah, you know, whatever. It's probably just, no, it's probably just the EMFs is, is, is what it's probably just. So, um, so anyway, your, your EMF environment, your sleep patterns, your, it, you know, your work, hours like night shift workers forget it your your intracellular sodium levels are going to be a train wreck um the health of your circadian biology um uh all of those things reflect and influence the amount of salt in your cells that 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 conduct electrical current um and and, and basically allow you to be vibrant and healthy and alive and full of energy right now um, what also influences <clears throat> the level of salt inside your cells are the amount of suppressive therapies you've taken over the course of your life or that you're currently on. I'm going to give you an example. Blood pressure medications will highly influ influence intracellular salt levels in a not beneficial way. Um, what other medications do that? Well, most of them do, but, um, Let's just name a few for fun. Uh, anything that messes with your dopamine levels, so anti-anxiety, anti-depression, um, clonopin, these type of uh, medications will absolutely influence your uh, the electrical charge in your cell, which is highly determined by the sodium levels in your cell. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna mention 
um, is that in my experience and perspective, um, people can all, the, the, the amount of salt inside your cells is also influenced by genetic predisposition. That's a whole topic in and of itself. But what I will, will say about it is um, <clears throat> your genetic code is contained within your cells and the mo molecules inside the cell are very much influenced by the health of your ancestors as well as your current lifestyle. Okay. Now that doesn't mean we have to like play the victim and we're like, oh, I have me bad energy levels and it's just grandpa's fault and there's nothing I can do about it. There's always something you can do about it, no matter what, you know, anyone or the doctor tells you, literally there's always something you can do about it. If somebody tells you they can't help you or there's nothing they can do about it, or there's nothing they can do to help, um, at the very least palliate the situation in a non-toxic way, you know, throw the peace sign up to them and, and find someone else. So um, let's talk about dietary salt intake, because this is what I'm going to focus on during this episode. But I wanted to also provide you with this insight uh, around the salt in your cells, um, because uh, I find that's very important as well. And uh, we don't talk about that so much. It's not, uh, you know, there's, it's just not talked about and there's a lot more we can understand about it that pertains to health and how we feel each day and so understanding that it's not just the salt you eat but it's also your environment that actually can influence your sodium levels particularly the uh intracellular sodium levels i think i've said intracellular too many times so far so we're gonna i'm gonna talk about dietary salt intake the salt that you eat uh, plays a, a foundational role in neurological health and development. Like if you are pregnant, get your salt on and in you. Good salt. I'm going to talk about what good salt is. Um, it's so important for uh, the baby's neurological health and development, also for adults and young kids, 100%. We all need it. It's very, very crucial uh, in our neurological health. Um, it also helps with satiation levels. Uh, it helps with uh, metabolic health and capacity. It helps to maintain fluid levels and balance. It supports kidney function and adrenal function and um, the central nervous system. It helps with muscular function and hydration levels throughout the body. It, it plays a huge role. Now, this is an important one that I think everyone can get on board with here is that when food enters your gut, hopefully it's salted because the salt in your food also helps you to absorb and assimilate nutrients more effectively. So you eat that food, it goes down to your gut and the sodium that's there helps to your, your gut to absorb and assimilate the nutrients uh, much more effectively. So um, it's really important to eat salt with your food. A low salt or a no salt diet, it, it's, it's not only a bad idea, but it's actually dangerous and you're gonna set yourself up for health issues. Salt is an essential uh, nutrient, mineral. So there's a lot to salt, right? Now, as I mentioned, during today's episode, I'm going to focus on salt and food. I'm gonna talk about salt in your diet um, and how to use salt way beyond just, you know, salt shaker. That can be fun too. That could be all great, but we're, we're going to expand on that. Um, I'm also going to teach you how to salt your foods properly and why, how to cook foods using salt to improve nutrient content and digestibility of the starches and proteins in your food. I'm going to teach you uh, actually my new favorite way to roast a chicken. I'm about to do this after this episode. Um, and I'm going to teach you how to cook super tender meat, fish, and veggies all by improving the way you salt these foods before you actually cook and or serve them. Okay. So 
Um, now, you know, I also just want to say that not only is this going to help you, you um, increase the nutrient content and mineral content in your foods and in, in your body then, but it's also going to help enhance the flavor of your food. When food tastes good, um, it's just as healing as the nutrients in our food. So when we combine these two things, it's like double bonus. Okay, before I dive into today's episode, um, I want to announce, and I know I've mentioned this on previous episodes, but um, I'm hosting an in-person Foundations of Classical Homeopathy Intensive this October 6th through 8th at our farm in northern New Mexico. And uh, during the intensive, I'm going to teach you all about classical homeopathy, how to use homeopathy to prevent and, dare I say, cure acute and chronic diseases. And of course, of course, of course, there will be farm fresh food. This will be a staple at the intensive as well. Um, you can learn more about the intensive by visiting my site, heathershepherd.com. Go to the homeopathy tab and you will see the um, drop down menu. There's a, a foundations intensive tab. So click on that, read more about it. And if you'd like to reserve your spot for the retreat, send an email my way and we can jump on a Zoom call to discuss details, get you started and so forth. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be fall here. Of course, it's fall everywhere in the States, obviously, but um, uh, fall to me is one of my favorite times of year because um, the abundance of, of the fall harvest is like, oh man, it's primo here. There's all these different types of chilies and squashes and um, believe it or not, we're getting probably in the next couple months, we're going to get ready to um, uh, bring our pigs, our hogs to slaughter. They're getting very big and they're feasting on the local farmers. We, we go to the farms and you know, fruit just drops from the trees and it's sitting there and just rotting. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like, can we come pick up the fruit for our pigs? And they're like, yes, come by. And so we come by and we literally get gallons and gallons and gallons of fruit, peaches and apples and pears and plums every week um, that we give to the pigs. So um, this is, I wasn't expecting to do this, but this was just kind of a side. If you raise pigs, um, it's really, it can be very helpful, very uh, beneficial to the flavor of the meat if you feed them fruit uh, one or two months before slaughter. Their meat will really develop a, a nice, uh, uh, more rich and uh, sweet flavor. And um, I mean, I'll let you know how it tastes and hopefully you can experience the taste too by when you visit the farm. But um, yeah, so that's, that's one of my favorite parts of fall. So I'm looking forward to, I think, I think the food at the fall retreat is going to be like, people are going to be like, oh my God, I can't eat another thing because we're just going to be, uh, you know, there's so much food at that time of the year. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you can send an email my way if you, if you want to know more or uh, save your spot, reserve your spot for the retreat. All right, let's talk salt. So um, yet another essential and vital mineral that has been shunned, processed, and laden with GMOs by our lovely government and FDA. Thank you so much. Now, I don't care if you have hypertension or not, you need salt in your diet. And in fact, if you have hypertension, you probably need more salt in your diet because it means that you're not absorbing the salt. And um, it means that your mineral, you have a, a significant mineral imbalance. I'll talk about hypertension here in a minute, but um, let's, I also want to mention before we really get into the heart of salt, please, for the love of God, if you do not use dash, you know, it's like some salt substitute thing that the medical doctors and the government recommend to hypertensive patients. It's like, please throw that crap in the garbage. I mean, I literally wouldn't even give that to, I won't give it to a stray cat, honestly. And um, 
get rid of it. So no, we want the real deal. We you need the real deal. Why? Because real salt is is chock full of minerals, and the body needs these minerals to function optimally. Without salt, you will die. Period. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I had a client this morning, and uh, she was like, you know, Heather, I'm just gonna. I, I hope you don't mind, but I'm just gonna give it to you straight. And I was like, okay, hang on. Like, have you listened to my podcast? Because <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, I, I was like, I, I think I really give it to you straight on the podcast. You know, it's like, I don't try to hold back or any, I literally can't hold back. So this is, <laughs> this is a place where I just let it all fly. So anyway, without salt, you will die, period. Um, but let's talk about high blood pressure for a minute. <clears throat> If you have high blood pressure, you don't have it because you eat too much salt, period. You have high blood pressure because of genetic predisposition, because of a um, stationary lifestyle, high stress, repressed anger, repressed emotions. Um, why else do you, oh, you have it because your blood sugar is out of balance, blood sugar issues and high hypertensive issues uh, go hand in hand, hand in hand. Um, and sure, of course, processed and packaged foods will be like, you know, pouring gasoline onto that fire, but you sure don't get high blood pressure from eating too much salt. Never, ever the root cause. If anybody tells you it is, you know, peace sign. So let me start by saying not all salt is created equal. There's of course, some shitty salt out there as there is of, of everything, you know, the salt, I, I can't, I think it's Morton's, the salt with the girl at the beach with like, she has like her booty showing. It's like, you know, totally ridiculous uh, marketing thing. You know, that's a red flag just by the label, but it's total crap. Don't use it. Don't buy it. No, don't bring that into your house. Many commercial salts also like this um, conventional table salt, like the Morton's, many commercial salts contain fillers and additives to help prevent the salt from caking. As if that's the worst thing ever. Oh my God, my salt is clumpy. And, you know, I wouldn't want to have to rub my fingers together uh, in an effort to break the salt apart. So, you know, that's why they say they prevent it from clumping, but really, do they just have excess like aluminum and um, corn and flour and talc and shit like this that they're like, have no idea what to do with. So they're like, well, we'll just put a little here and there in the salt. And then we'll call it like, and it's like nice because it doesn't clump. Right. You know where I go with this because obviously they don't know what to do with half the chemicals and shit they have. And they just think of things to put it in vaccines. Why not salt? Sure. Um, uh, cereal. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Peanut butter. Why not? So, um, salt is the same thing. Okay. So what are some of these, um, additives and fillers that they add to help prevent the salt from caking? Well, I named, um, most of them there, but um, things like dextrose, which is code for GMO corn. If you see that, you're like, oh, it's a vegetable. No, dextrose is, is literally code for GMO corn. But also flour is added to salt, talc. Okay, like flashback, remember when Johnson & Johnson banned their baby powder because it contained talc? Why was this an issue? It, because it contained high levels of asbestos. <laughs> right? They're like, oh, shoot, we couldn't get away with it there. So let's just put it in the salt and where we continue to get away with it there. So, um, you know, uh, that that's an issue, right? These things we should not be, be eating and certainly not in the form that the government and the FDA and so forth creates in their food lab and then adds to our food. It's really a horrific idea. Um, and then, you know, I just want to mention here that, you know, have you ever heard, heard people say, I'm sure you have, I, I hear it all the time, you know, like uncle so-and-so or whoever got lung cancer and never smoked a cigarette in his life. Well, you know, we have to think about these sort of things that people add to food, um, you know, like, like talc in salt that contains asbestos. And then, you know, I mean, of course, 
chronic disease is always multifactorial and what, what actually causes it and what's at the root. But you have to wonder about stuff like this that they add to our food on the sly and then just think that somebody gets lung cancer without smoking because it's just bad luck. It's never, ever just bad luck. Okay, so, so avoid things like iodized salt it's highly processed, avoid processed salt, avoid the commercial shit because that's exactly what it is. It's just, it's total shit, okay? Spend the few extra bucks for some good quality salt. Okay, segue, let's go into what is good quality salt. Sea salt is the name of the game. But again, you want the good stuff. Of course, everyone's now like, oh, sea salt's amazing and they, they um, we, we have to pay attention to the type of sea salt, the less processed stuff. Uh, and you want this stuff that's literally from the sea. Uh, it never fails to go with Celtic or Celtic sea salt, whatever you want to call it. It's legit, has a high mineral content, minimal processing. Um, it's I use it every day. Now, a lot of people use real salt and salt from other regions, and I have no issues with this. Well, I have that's not true. I have one issue with this, see? You need to use some sea salt in your diet because you need the trace minerals in sea salt, you know, especially and particularly iodine. I don't eat real salt or the or, or or salts that are not harvested from the actual sea for this reason. Okay. Now I'm about to get fancy with salt. Okay. But stick with me because there's a lot of health benefits here that I'm going to drop, okay? Okay, we see all these different kinds of sea salts. There, there's regular sea salt, flor de sal, right? Flower salt, um, salt grease, which is just gray salt, right? Sea salt, let's differentiate between these and how to use these in your diet and when you're cooking. Okay, sea salt it's, is what's left behind after seawater evaporates. Seawater evaporates, boom, you have sea salt. Florida salt is harvested on the surface of seabeds, okay? It's less re refined, um, and it's, it's a result of this gradual, it's more of a gradual evaporation process that can literally take up to five years to achieve. So less processed, and it's going to be a little bit of different mineral content because it's harvested on the surface of, of seabeds, okay? Salt grease, gray salt, is when salt falls below the surface of the water and then attracts various minerals. And you know, gray salt, you see, it's kind of like watery. It's like thicker. It's literally gray because when the salt is allowed to fall below the surface, it attracts all this other uh, uh, mineral content to it, okay? So, you know, when you hear this, you might think, oh, I should just use the latter two forms of salt because of the higher mineral content. Okay, now the thing is, regular sea salt penetrates into food much more readily and effectively. And we need that to happen in order to, um, uh, absorb, assimilate our foods in the gut properly. So we actually, that should be the main salt that, that we eat, okay? That should be the, the bulk of our salt should come from sea salt. Um, now, um, the other two salts, uh, flor de sal, Saw grease, right? Um, these are great. We should have them in the diet, but they're best used as finishing salts. Um, and, and they're packed with so many minerals that only a small amount is truly needed in the daily diet. Okay. So I want to differentiate between those three salts. Okay. Now well, I want to, I want to put this plug in there. And um, I am this this year, um, I'm going to be offering an ancestral diet, I should say the sunlight diet. I haven't got the wording totally down. Um, um, 
and Sunlight RX certification program. And it's stuff, it's 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 topics like this that when we can understand them and fine tune something like this in somebody's diet could make a huge difference. Like think of somebody with hypertension who's eating Morton salt and around a high EMF environment. And they're like, um, they find their way to you and you're like, Hey, look, you can't eat that salt. And just, this is how you hardwire your internet. And then in four months or tomorrow, they don't have hypertension, right? These little things, they make a huge difference. And I want to give you an example here of, of anybody out there struggling with thyroid issues. I tell all of my hypothyroid and Hashimoto's um, uh, clients, whether they come for ancestral diet counseling in session or, or homeopathy, um, to add Florida salt and salt grease to their foods because, and, and maybe even more so than the average person, because the thyroid needs more nutrients, um, and if you're struggling with a thyroid issue, this is a whole topic in and of itself, right? Okay. Because, um, one, people have Hashimoto's and, um, and, and hypo, hyperthyroid, excuse me, hypothyroid, um, for, for multiple reasons. It's just not because they're not eating enough salt, right? But these two salts, those high mineral content at the sea can help can be an asset to their healing process. Of course, the thyroid needs more nutrients um, that are also used up by, by a high pathogen load in the body and exposure to EMF and fake light. It just, you know, just the thyroid's exposed. It's right towards the surface of the body. And these this organ is very much um, easily influenced by our environment. Now, Hashimoto's is the quintessential autoimmune condition uh, caused by suppressive therapies. I mean, you could say that for anything, to be honest, but Hashimoto's, it's like this, it's autoimmunity. We don't know what causes it. It's so easy. What causes it that there have, this is what causes it. I'm going to tell you right here. There've been multiple infections that one has had over the course of their life that have all been suppressed with antibiotics um, or other medications. And what happens is the thyroid receptor is bound to these pathogens because why the antibiotics shove these things into this, they, they, they cause this issue because the, the infection gets suppressed. And so no longer does somebody have strep throat or eczema or UTI or whatever the infection or pneumonia, whatever it was. Um, but now they start to gradually get these symptoms of Hashimoto's, they're sluggish, they have weight gain, maybe they have um, they grow, you know, especially women, facial hair, you know, there's, there's an obvious imbalance going on. And it typically happens over time with the more suppressive therapies. The, um, the pathogen, uh, takes the place of, uh, latches onto the thyroid receptor and then causes this basically autoimmune, heightened autoimmune situation. That's, in my experience, the cause of Hashimoto's, okay? Sure, you could add heavy metals into that mix and so forth, but um, what I have seen time and time and time again, all of these infections, suppress, 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 the, the thyroid receptor is just totally preoccupied with the pathogen, and... Um, and then it can no longer, the, the, I, there's no room for anything else. There's no room for the vitamin D. There's no room for the iodine. There's no room for these things. That's the root cause of Hashimoto's in my experience. And of course, Western medicine has, they're like, I don't know what causes it. <laughs> like, it's a, like it's a fucking mystery. And, uh, you know, no, no offense, NDs, because I have some friends who are NDs and I think they're, you know, good people, but honestly, they're pretty useless. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they just want to give you a crap ton of supplements and run labs. And then if the labs are imbalanced, then you change the supplement schedule. It's like, what in the hell is that doing? It's literally keeping somebody on a merry-go-round. We're not getting anywhere. There's no mention of the suppressive therapies, how to detox those <clears throat> homeopathy, right? How to use different salts in the diet to support your thyroid health. How do you use sunlight to support your thyroid health? How to block artificial light? You know, this, this stuff that, you know, will actually get people results. It's like, 
neither side of the medical field is looking at this or addressing this. No mention, okay? I should do an episode on Hashimoto soon, but maybe that was it in a nutshell right there. Boom. Back to salt. Quick mention with regard to kosher salt, in case that's important for any of you. Kosher salt was, was is traditionally used in the process of literally koshering, which means removing blood from meat. So it like extracts it. It doesn't contain any of the uh, shitty additives that regular conventional table salt contains. At least I haven't found that. Um, however, it scores low when it comes to mineral content. So I would aim for my top three salts, sea salt, salt of floor, uh, salt grease as your main dietary salts. Now let's, okay, let's talk about how to use salt to its utmost potential um, when it comes to cooking. I didn't go to cooking school. I'm just going to like, um, what would you call this? Like, you know, disclaimer, I didn't go to cooking school one because I hate formal education and, and all cooking schools use shit ingredients, um, and are taught inside under fake light. So I, I took a hard pass there. Now, over the course of my life, I've worked in a lot of kitchens. I've worked a lot of restaurant jobs. Um, I've worked a lot of catering jobs and everyone was always like, oh my gosh, Heather, taste this, taste that. And it's like filled with a vegetable oil or something. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm so full. I can't, I just didn't want to put myself in that situation. So I've chosen to, well, let's just say for one, I learned a shit ton from my Italian mother, her Sicilian father, as well as my dad's side of the family, my, my family, both sides, there's, there's very earthy um, very food focused. Like we, we, we go to visit my family or they come to visit us and the conversation is very food focused and how to make this and do that. And remember when, Aunt, when Poppy did this and then, you know, and then Aunt Dawn's buttermilk brownies and this and that. And it's like very food focused. And my, my wife is like, oh my God, can we talk about something else? And it's like, you know, so I learned a lot and, and continue to do so from my family when it comes to cooking. So, you know, cooking runs through, through my blood. All my siblings love cooking. They're phenomenal cooks. My brother makes the best um, smoked brisket I think I've ever had. And he lit he's, he's schooled me several times on my reverse sear ribeyes. He's like, Heather, you got to do it like this and cook it on this surface and, and do it like that. And honestly, he nails it every time. So, you know, um, so, you know, aside from that, I think I, I probably have minimum a uh, hundred cookbooks that I just, if somebody, you know, sits down to read a book at night, um, I'm either reading something usually about farming, about a, a somebody's cooking chef memoir, or, or I'm literally reading a recipe book in bed and <laughs> my wife's sitting across from me and she's reading something like on, on eco psychology or, or um, complex PTSD or you know something like this. So, um, but you know, that that's our, that's our book choices. So basically I've learned from my family and from reading a lot of cookbooks and from spending time in Mexico, I actually learned a lot um, uh, about, about cooking, especially um, uh, all of the amazing, phenomenal, rich culture and history that their, their culture brings. Um, so anyway, salt not only enhances mineral content of your food, and has health benefits, but it, it improves the digestibility of your food. You literally cannot digest your food without salt, you know, salt bile's you know, right? Like the gallbladder produces salt bile's to help break down your food. If you don't have a gallbladder, you better be eating your fair share of good quality salt. Go with the big three that I mentioned in this episode. Okay. Um, so anyway, okay, now I'm going to talk about how, how we're going to use it in our foods and cooking. So salt abides by osmosis because it draws water out of any ingredient that it comes in contact with. So, you know, why, who gives, like, why is that important, Heather? Here's why. So the key to improving fla the flavor of your food, um, you know, please, dear God, we want your food to taste good right? It's why I hate fad diets because it's like suck on a piece of cardboard to get healthy. It's like, no, your food has to taste good. That's a huge part of health and healing. Okay. So, um, you know, now 
the key to improving the flavor as well as all those health benefits I talked about of your food is um, knowing how much salt to add to which foods um, and when to add it to the food. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. Okay, let's take a cucumber or a tomato. These foods contain so much water, right? They're, 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 we know they're, they're very watery foods. Call it deuterium, if you will. It contains water, okay? And um, if you salt your cucumber tomato too far in advance, it's just going to be like a puddle of water. It's going to be soggy. It's not, it's, it's going to be overkill, okay? But salt a cucumber or a tomato five minutes before you eat it, and the flavor enhances hugely in a big way. Okay, now let's take meaty fish like swordfish or tuna. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go through some different foods here and how to salt them to enhance their flavor when you cook them, and then ultimately enhance the digestibility of the food as well. Okay, let's take a meaty fish like swordfish or tuna. You want to salt those about thirty minutes before you cook it. Take it out, salt it. You can set it on the counter or you can keep it in your fridge, but just salt it thirty minutes before you cook it. The flavor will improve. And then not only this, it's going to decrease the cooking time of, of the food and it's going to reduce the amount of salt that you actually add after cooking because the salt will penetrate deeper into the tissues. This is a big, this is a big deal. It's like, it's something that, that, that um, not many people understand about, about salt and seasoning their food. So then when you, when you salt your foods properly before cooking them, then you can just focus on one of the high mineral finishing salts if you want to add more salt before eating. Always taste test, however, before adding salt, okay? That might be super obvious. Okay, let's take flaky fish. You know, um, what, like, you know, not as thick. Cod, um, even salmon, you know, um, less meatier fish. Salt about 15 minutes before cooking, not too long in, in advance, or um, it'll be too salty. The salt can actually um, start to break down the food more. Like, you know, we don't want that. You want it to enhance the flavor. Short time, 15 minutes before, before cooking. Now, I know you guys are waiting for me to talk about meat, so let's talk meat. Lean meats can lean meats contain more water than fattier cuts of meat. So you want to salt these meats days in advance before cooking. Two days in advance, Thanksgiving turkey, two to three days in advance, or approaching Thanksgiving. Try salting your turkey two to three days in advance while it's in the fridge. And um flavor will be way better. Okay, so lean lean cuts of meats. Two days, okay, what is this? Like, for example, I made a, um, <laughs> people are gonna be like horrified. Um, our neighbors and good friends uh, had a bunch of goats. They just, they just got some goats. They drove up to Colorado and they got some goats and they brought them back. They had them at their property for a week and they're like, oh no, no, nope, not going to work. I mean, goats are destructive. I won't get goats because they get out of everything. You have to constantly fix the fence. You have to constantly do this and that. They're going to eat everything. Some people do well with goats. That's not my thing, but <laughs> moral of the story, they got goats. They were like, nope, not going to work out. <laughs> the dude killed their goats and harvested them. He used the meat, right? So we had all this goat meat because he couldn't take it anymore. They're driving him, just driving him crazy. They put it to good use, right? He, he made me, he, he butchered the goats he, uh, in, a, in a really solid way. And he gave us some goat meat. We actually traded some chicken, some of our chickens for goat meat. And goat meat is super lean. So that's an example. Like if you have a lean meat like that, you know, I salted it, I think two days in advance and I made a goat curry out of the, he gave up me a bunch of goat uh, legs and uh, salted them a um, couple days in advance, made a curry with them. Oh my God, it was so good. It was awesome. Um, now, uh, 
fattier cuts of meat, this is this is important to, to distinguish because um, fat throws off the whole thing because salt doesn't penetrate fat like it does muscle, okay? There's not as much water in it. So when you, when you have fattier cuts, you can end up with some, and you salt it ahead of time, you can end up with some bites of meat being super salty while others are like more bland. Or if you over salt a, a fatty cut, you can take a bite and it's like, oh my God, it tastes like a salt lick. Now, of course you can do that with anything, but um, the salt doesn't get distributed evenly when there's big fatty chunks that are involved and not taken into consideration. So if you have a fattier piece of meat that you wanna pre-season, you know, 24 hours tops, and don't salt the, the, the fat chunk, like the thick piece of fat. Don't, don't salt that part. Just focus on the meat. Now, my rib, rib eyes, right, which are considered a fattier cut, I don't salt those. People like salt the rib eye, you know, to make it more tender two days in advance. I tried it and I didn't like it. So, you know, go try it out. Go with your personal preference. But, you know, salting that literally just a, like six hours before I made it was plenty of time. And um, I mean, you can't, you know, ribeyes are, are amazing in general. So, um, but, you know, try these things out the next time you cook and see what you notice. And usually you have to add a little bit more salt than you think is appropriate because it's going to penetrate deep into the tissues. It's not like when you sprinkle it along top and then you're just getting like the salt on the top. When you season something ahead of time, you give the, the salt time to penetrate into the tissues and that's what enhances the flavor because it draws all the nutrients out of the food and it, and it does so over a period of time. So, you know, start start small and, and then experiment with it. Okay, last time I added this amount of salt and I'm gonna add, you know, maybe half a teaspoon more and see how it goes. So get, get individual with it. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention one last thing because um, if anybody steam, I shouldn't say steam, cooks vegetables in water, right? So obviously I'm not, I don't do this very often, right? It's not, but it's not my preference, but sometimes like blanching or something like that, can be um, a good way to, to cook vegetables. Very simple. So here's, here's, here's the thing, because we know this about reverse osmosis water, that when we take reverse osmosis water and all the minerals have basically been um, depleted from the water, and it's, right, because they're, they've just, everything's been removed, we have to add minerals back into it. Well, the same thing happens with your um, cooking water, when you're cooking vegetables in it. If you don't properly season your cooking water, what happens is the nutrients in your veggies leach out and go into the water. And that's why everyone's like, oh, all my nutrients are lost in the cooking process. Only when you don't salt your water um, properly. Like you need adequate amounts of salt. Like, you know, maybe it depends on how much veggie you're cooking also, right? You're just cooking a little bit, right? Then that's going to be different than if you're cooking heaps of green beans or something like that. But if you salt the water um, enough, what happens is the nutrients actually stay in the vegetable and the any nutrients in the salt are allowed to penetrate into the vegetable. So it's like this reverse thing happens when the vegetables are cooked in a mineral rich um, water. So you know, the next time you blanch or flash cook a vegetable in water is sometimes it can be good. Sometimes it can be awesome to do that with say green beans and you, you take them out and they're like kind of, they're cooked, but they're still kind of crunchy. That can be, and you add a ton of butter to them, right? That can be really nice. So um, the next time you, you cook veggies in water, make sure to adequately salt your water um, and then, you know, before you add your veggies in, it doesn't matter if you add the salt before or after boiling, but just don't let it boil for like minutes and you're doing something else and you forget about it because then all the minerals will evaporate. So, um, there's a lot I can say about salt, but that's what I'll say for today. I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope that you, uh,
I'm curious to hear how it goes when you start salting your foods here in, in some new ways. Maybe you're already doing it, but either way, I'd love to hear um, how it goes for you and um, salt your friend. Use the big three that I mentioned today and uh, see you next week.